recording. I want to uh, preach this morning on He is Risen. Uh, sorry, there's no lights, but hopefully you can see okay. But He is Risen. What a tremendous, tremendous uh, three words. He is Risen. And that's what I want to preach on. It's the greatest event in all of history. Uh, creation was a, 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 a tremendous event. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God spoke light into existence. It was a wonderful thing. Everything that was made is created. Nothing evolved. Nothing came by itself. It was all created. But as great as that was, uh, it's not the greatest event in history. The greatest event in history is the resurrection. You know, think about this. In Genesis 1, it says in verse 16, And God made two great lights, the greater to light to rule the day, the lesser, <coughs> excuse me, light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Just, he just, think of that. He just says, he made the stars also. Now, I was thinking about that this week. And uh, why, why does God just, he made the stars also. I mean, those stars are bigger than the earth. And there, there's so many of them. Why is it just counted uh, so little in Scripture? Why, why is it so little said about the creation of, of uh, stars compared to other things? Well, uh, they have little, less to do with us, really. I mean, we have more to do with the rain. We have more to do with animals, don't we? And so uh, I just thought that was interesting. But think about this. God just basically sk almost skips over the creation of, of stars. We would, we would, I mean, if I was writing about it, I mean, there's billions of stars. I'm sure that I would, I would cover it more than say he made the stars also. So creation is a wonderful event, but it's not the most important event. I mean, the incarnation, that's... God becoming flesh, Jesus Christ becoming flesh and, and, and being a baby in, in, the, in the womb of, of, of a woman named Mary. What an amazing event. And most amazing is, is Emmanuel, God with us. Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. What an amazing event that, that God would become flesh. But that's not the most amazing event in all of history. The resurrection is. And then the crucifixion. It's uh, beyond our understanding even that God the Son, having become man, died the most horrific death known to mankind that, that God the Son would be made sin for us who knew no sin so that we could have our sins forgiven. The Bible says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What a tremendous event, but that's not the most important event. As a matter of fact, uh, the, the crucifixion is powerless without the resurrection. Take your Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians 15. The creation, incarnation, and crucifixion leave many empty and hopeless without the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection for the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Useless. Your faith, without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, your faith is useless. It's uh, without hope. Then verse 6, 15, Yea, and we are false, false witnesses of God. 
because we testify that of God that he hath raised Christ from the dead, whom he raised not up, if that the dead not rise not. If, if the dead can't rise, then Jesus Christ didn't rise. Verse 16, For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and you are yet in your sins. If Jesus Christ did not raise from the dead, you still have a problem. Sin. And your sin would keep you from going to heaven. Uh, you are yet in your sins. Verse 18. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Uh, if Christ isn't risen from the dead, the people that have died, they're all perished. They're all, they're all gone to hell. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you can't get to heaven. Verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Christianity is the worst religion in the world without the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a hopeless religion. It gives you no hope. But He is risen. Amen? He is risen. But, verse 20, now is <coughs> excuse me, Christ risen <coughs> from the dead. And become the first first of them that's slept. slept. Praise the Lord. Uh, he is risen. He is the first fruit. For, by, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. What a wonderful thing. We serve a risen Savior. What a tremendous three small words. He is risen. Hallelujah. We are not a hopeless religion we have wonderful hope because we serve a risen savior i want to read you a, a a quote by a famous scottish preacher alexander mclaren he's a baptist preacher uh, brethren let us lay this to heart that unless we believe in the resurrection of jesus christ the saying he was crucified is the saddest word that can be spoken about any of the great past of the past if Jesus Christ be lying in some nameless grave, then all the power of his death is gone. And he, as it, and it are nothing to me or to you or to any of our fellow men more than a thousand deaths of mighty ones of old. But Easter day transfigures the gloom of the day of the crucifixion and the rising of the sun and it morning and its morning glides and explains the cross. Now stand forth as the great redeeming power of the world, where my sins and yours and the whole world have been expiated and done away. And now instead of it ignominy, it is glory. Instead of being defeated, it is victory. Instead of looking upon that death as the lowest point of the master's humiliation, may we look at upon him as he himself as the highest point of his glorification. For the cross becomes the great means of winning men to himself. The very throne of his power. One historical fact of the resurrection depends all the worth and meaning of the death of Christ. I thought that was a good quote. The, the resurrection gives meaning to the death of Christ. Without the resurrection, there's no meaning to the death of Christ. It's such an important event that it's mentioned each one of the evangelists. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John each mention it. Each one of them give a, uh, it from a different point of view. But I want us to consider it. And uh, so I want us to, to, to go back to, to Mark chapter 16. Mark 16. <clears throat> And verse 6 is going to be our text verse. He saith unto them, Be not afraid. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. First of all, he is not here. First of all, he saith unto them. Who is the he? Who is speaking to them? Go ahead. An angel. An angel. You're correct. 
But actually in Mark, it doesn't tell us an angel. What does it tell us in Mark? Yeah. Young man. We need to compare Scripture with Scripture. Angels appear in the Bible as what? Yeah. Young men. Young men. Uh, that's how they appear. And uh, so, keep your ver fingers there, but let's look at Matthew. And sometimes, in this story, uh, sometimes there's two uh, angels together, and sometimes there's one. And that's why we need to compare Scripture with Scripture. When we compare Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we get the whole picture. The Bible tells us to study to show thyself approved unto God. God expects us to, to, to study this out. So, uh, Selvin got it because she has obviously read more than just Matthew, right? I mean Mark. She's read Matthew. And so Matthew tells us in chapter 28, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Uh, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. So, uh, we know, <coughs> excuse me, from Matthew, that it was an angel. So we compare Scripture with Scripture. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. <coughs> excuse me. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So we've got to compare Scripture with Scripture. Now, uh, what's the first thing the angel tells these ladies. Go ahead, say it. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't listen to me. Why would why are they they gonna be afraid? Because they don't believe. Jesus said he was going to raise from the dead. If they saw an angel and they were... Understand this. They went to the grave to find a dead man. Right? Yeah. But Jesus said he wasn't going to be dead. But they didn't believe. When we don't believe, it always brings fear to our life. Do you know, Jesus said, my peace... I leave with thee. The only prime reason I'm going to be afraid is if I don't keep trusting Jesus. So they're, they're, they're afraid. And, 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 you know, but God doesn't want us afraid. Fear hath what? Torment. Torment. And it, it's true. So God always will comfort us. So when I'm afraid... I just cry out to God, Lord, I'm afraid, help me. And I'm trusting, Lord, help me. And he will. And so these, this angel spoke words of comfort. They were afraid of the angel. They were afraid of the empty tube. They were afraid of everything. But they were afraid because they were faithless. I'm afraid because I am what? Faithless. But God is always there. Wonderful. And then he says, listen to this. Verse 6. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth. Interesting that uh, uh, the angel refers to Jesus as Jesus of Nazareth. It's not, it's not a common way to refer to him. As a matter of fact, that's what Pilate uh, wrote on the... the uh, again, you have to compare all the, uh, the Gospels to get exactly what was written on the, the cross. But uh, <coughs> in John 19.19, Pilate wrote... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Yeah. Uh, this uh, Peter even called him Jesus of Nazareth in in uh, in Acts four. Be it known unto you and all men of Israel, but the name of Jesus of Na Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified 
whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. It's interesting. Pilate wrote that. Why did Pilate call Jesus, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews? He was mocking him, you know. He was mocking the man that he crucified. And it's interesting that that mocking name became a, man, a name of reverence. For Peter used it in preaching, and Peter didn't use it mocking. He used it as an honor. You know, I'm a Baptist. Do you know that the Baptist, where did the name Baptist come from? came from Anabaptist. What's Anabaptist? What's it mean? It means it was a term, a mocking term, against baptism. Well, Anabaptists and Baptists are not against bap baptism. I'm against baby baptism. And so um, that mocking name Ba Anabaptists so, so all throughout Europe and, and the world they were called Anabaptists saying you're against baptism but now the, the Anna got dropped and were called Baptists and I'm proud to be a Baptist amen I believe in, 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 in baptism and I, I, I stand against baby baptism and so it's interesting just how uh, names are changed but I want you to get this uh, let's, so he's called Jesus of Nazareth which was crucified. Was. Past, present, future. Go ahead. Past. It had happened. He was crucified. It's not continual crucifixion. It, there is no continual sacrifice of Christ. It is a finished work. And we're going to see that. So, he's not here. He is not in the tomb. They were seeking Jesus. They wanted to embalm him. They wanted, uh, you know, to, 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 to treat his body with respect. But they didn't believe. He had told them. Uh, he had been telling them for a long time. <coughs> but they refused to believe. But we understand that Jesus was crucified. It is determined, uh, sorry, it is a finished work. In 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, Paul says, For I have determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It is finished. Crucified. Him crucified. Not Him being continually crucified. And uh, uh, you'll see why I'm saying that in a few minutes. Revelation 1 verse 18. I am He that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of death, hell and death. So... Uh, which was Christified. He is risen. That's really, you know, very short words, aren't they? He, two letters, is, two letters, risen, five letters. Very simple, yet extremely profound. So simple that we could tell the youngest child in church, he is risen. She'd understand it. You know, uh, God keeps it simple so that everybody can get it. Amen? What a wonderful thought. But the amazing thing is the only people that seem to remember that Jesus said he was going to rise again was his enemies. In, uh, you, well, I'm going to read this. You go to Mark, please. But in Matthew 27, verse 6, 20, 63, his enemy said, saying, Sir, we remember that the deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Isn't it amazing? They remembered it, but the apostles forgot it. The, the, uh, the ladies, Mary Magdalene, and Mary, Mother James, and Salome, they forgot it, but his enemies remembered it. Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. And he came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen, till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. And they kept that saying within themselves, questioning with one another what the rising from the dead should mean. Matthew 4, uh, 12, 40. 
For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall be the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Listen, Jesus could not be crucified on a Friday. If he, he arose, I'm going to email you uh, a thing by Pastor uh, uh, O'Sullivan he sent there. But Jesus was three days and three nights, right? Isn't that what it said? Jesus arose. Uh, now, even those that say that, under, say that Jesus was crucified on a, on a Friday a, a, acknowledge that he rose Saturday after 6 o'clock. The Jewish day, Sunday, starts after 6. And if we go back in, 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 uh, in Mark 16, and they went very early in the morning. How long? How, what's very early in the morning? How, how early in the morning is very early in the morning? I don't think 4 o'clock. I'd say early in the morning is 4 o'clock. I'd say 3 o'clock. I'd go with anybody go later than, than, than 4 o'clock. 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. They're very, they're very early in the morning. And where is Jesus? Risen. Risen. He arose sometime after 6 o'clock Saturday evening because that's when the Jewish s Sabbath ended and that's the first day of the week. So, I will send you a chart. Uh, uh, and if I, don't, I forget to send it to you, email me and I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you. But Pastor Sullivan has done a good chart on that. So, if he was crucified on a Friday evening, which the Roman Catholic Church teaches... So 24 hours of uh, three days and three nights. So Friday evening, Saturday evening, Sunday evening, Monday evening. There's just, you know, he would have to arise uh, on a Monday evening. Uh, so anyways, uh, he, he was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And he was going to rise again. Jesus said in John chapter 19, uh, 2 verse 19, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, Forty and six years was this temple in building. And wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. After the resurrection, they believed him. Wouldn't, wouldn't it have been better for them to believe before? Mm -hmm. So, think of this. They're seeking a dead man in the grave. But, but he's not dead. They're seeking really a living man. They thought he was dead. They thought they were seeking a dead man in the grave. And that, that's a reasonable thing, to go to a, to go to a graveyard to see a dead man, Right? But it's not reasonable to go for a living man. If, uh, if you want to come and visit me tomorrow, who's going to go to the graveyard here at the end of Bishopstown? Nobody. You're alive, Pastor. That would be stupid. You're alive. Thinking of it. Jesus said, I am going to rise again. I'm, and he told them exactly. Three days and three nights. They should have expected him to be alive. Amen? You don't go to visit somebody that's alive in the grave. And, and uh, they're rebuked for it in Luke 24. And as they were afraid <coughs> and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto him, uh, that's the, why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spake unto you while he was yet in Galilee. Jesus had very clearly told them and so the, the, the angels, and this is in Luke, tell them very clearly, why in the world are you looking for a, a live man among the dead? It doesn't make sense, does it? But they did it because they did not, what? Believe. believe. They were afraid because they did not believe. They're seeking a live man among the dead because they did not believe. And so now, he is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they did. Look in the tomb. Take a look. He's not in there. 
That stone was rolled away not to let Jesus out, but to show that the tomb was empty. Uh, understand, the Romans and the Jews did everything they could to keep him in the grave, but they couldn't, could they? There was an empty grave. Uh, and, and praise the Lord, that is, is a great proof of the resurrection. Now, let me read you this. Um, Spurgeon said this. I love this. Uh, he said, this is engraved, engraved on Jesus' tomb. He is not here. He is risen. You know, you, uh, you have tombstones uh, of people and say things, here lies so-and-so, born such-and-such -such a date, died such-and-such -such a date. Jesus, tomb, he is risen. <laughs> Hallelujah, it's empty. Uh, Spurgeon says, on other people's graves, it is written, here lies so-and-so. But on Christ's sepulcher is recorded, he is not here. He is everywhere else, but he's not here. He is with us in our solitude. He is with us in our public assemblies. But there is one place where he is not. That is the empty tomb. Thank God that he is not there. We do not <coughs> worship a dead man lying in a grave. He on whom we rely has risen from the dead. He has gone into glory where he ever liveth to carry out the great design of salvation. He is not here. Just like he said, and, and the wonderful thing about the resurrection is Jesus did it by his own power. You don't need to turn there, but I'm going to read you John chapter 10. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and have known the mine. <coughs> Excuse me. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep, and other sheep have I, which are not of this fold. Them also must I bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No man taketh it from me. Who killed the Jesus? Did the Romans kill Jesus? No. Nope. Did the Jews kill Jesus? No. Nope. Listen. No man taketh it from me. Who killed Jesus? He lay his life down. But I lay it down of myself. Jesus could have walked away at any time, but he lay his life down of himself. And then he says, I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. We have a risen Savior that rose by his own power. Amen? Amen. And he, because of that, he can take me to heaven. This commandment have I received of my Father. He died because he willingly died for my sin, and he rose because he had the power to do it. Death had no hold on him. And he said, the, the angel said, Behold the place where they, they laid him. Look in there. You know, uh, we were in, 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 in Jerusalem, but they never showed us a tomb. And uh, 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 where, where they, they never showed us a tomb where they said, there, there, In there is the body of Jesus, because it's an empty tomb. Amen. And all the enemies, the Jews, the Romans, they just, there is no answer to the empty tomb. And so what a wonderful thought about that. Now I want you to think about this. He's not in the tomb. And he's not in the Eucharist. In Luke, um, you don't need to turn there. And I, I want you, it's so important to think about this. He was crucified. He's not is crucified. He's not continually being crucified. The Eucharist of the Roman Catholic Church is a denial of the empty tomb. And I'm going to read this through to you and explain it to you. What does the Bible say? The Bible says in Luke 22, 19, And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in what? In remembrance of me. The Lord's Supper is the remembrance of of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, 24 and 25. And when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do, what? In remembrance of me. 
Verse 25, and after the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, <coughs> This cup is the new, uh, sorry, this cup is the new testament, my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. We have Jesus was crucified, buried, but is what? Risen. He is risen. Now I want to read you the official Roman Catholic doctrine. This is a summary. And I've taken this summary from uh, chat.openai.com. According to Catholic teaching, the Eucharist is a sacrifice in which, Jesus, which the sacrifice of Christ on the cross is represented in an unbloody manner. Well, listen, if Jesus is being uh, represented in an unbloody manner, he's not risen. He's still being crucified, right? Well, he is risen. Amen? I serve a risen Savior. <coughs> Excuse me. This sacrifice is perpetuated through the celebration of the Mass. So they believe in the perpetual sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But that is a denial of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He can't be continually being sacrificed and be risen. One of them's a lie. Which one's a lie? The continual sacrifice. Because he is risen. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. What a difference. Uh, the sacrifice is perpetuated through the celebration of the mass, mass, which is the central act of worship in the Catholic Church. Catholics believe that the Eucharist is the source of spiritual nourishment, that it strengthens the bond uh, and the unity among believers. The reception of the Eucharist is considered essential for salvation. And Catholics are encouraged to receive it frequently, ideally at every Mass. He's not here. He's not in the grave. And he's not in the Eucharist. He is risen. The continual sacrifice of Christ is an attack of Satan on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because if he is continually sacrificed, he can't be risen. Why do the Catholics have Jesus on the cross? I mean, you see it. You go to any Catholic church, you see Jesus on the cross. Why? Because they don't serve a risen Savior. Okay, they say he's risen, but they don't believe it. They believe in the continual sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said, it is finished. That's done. He is risen. It's finished. What a wonderful thing. And uh, where is he? Well, he's gone to heaven. He arose, uh, and now he ascended into heaven, and he's coming back for me. Uh, in Acts 1, verse 16, uh, it says, "Ye, Which said also, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which was taken from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. We can't have Jesus coming again unless he's in heaven. Amen? He is risen and he is ascended into heaven and he's coming back. He said, I go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will what? Come again. Come again. He's coming again. Amen. I am looking for Jesus. This week I read something so horrendous and wicked I could not hardly believe it. And it is in the library of schools in Ireland. Uh, I don't know if you followed this on the news, but... Uh, 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 I forgot the name of the, sh the program. I'd have to look it up, but uh, one of the programs, Live Talk? No. Mrs. Smith, do you remember the name of that uh, program I talked, told you it was on? Maybe she's, no, I can't say. Do you remember? Lifeline. Liveline. Liveline were actually kind of making fun of, of, of a group and said they are anti-LGBT, and but they're not. And this group was complaining about a book in the libraries, in the, the schools in Ireland, and, and what's being taught. And so the person started to read what was, and I, would, I, I wouldn't even read it to you guys. It's so bad. But if you want, I can send you. It, it is so horrendous. and talks about <laughs> just terrible, terrible stuff. 
and the person in the live line, the presenter said, okay, well, stop reading that, stop reading that. You know what? It is so wicked today. I'm looking for the Lord to come today. Because the Bible tells us as it was in the days of what? Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, that's just like it is today, isn't it? But you know what? If you don't have a risen Savior, He can't come again. Can He? <coughs> I thank God. He said He'll come again. And you know, Christ is one other place. He's in heaven, but He's in my heart. Look at Colossians 1. Colossians chapter 1. Very slow turning the Bible this morning. I'm the last person to get there, but I'll get there. <coughs> Colossians 1, verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of the this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Do you know what? When you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, He indwells you. What did it say? Christ, where? In you. Listen to it. To whom God would make, no would make known what is the riches of, his, of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, when Jesus Christ uh, was in the grave, he was in the grave as a man. But when he rose again, he, 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 the limitations of his, his, his humanity were lifted. And he became omnipresent again. So that he could dwell in us. But if he's in the grave, he can't be in you. You follow me? Uh, we, there is no hope for the Christian with a Savior in the grave. There's no hope for a Christian if you, if you have to take him every day at the, or every week at a Mass. But he is not here. He is risen. What a wonderful, wonderful story. I'm sorry my cough has uh, not enabled me to uh, preach as effectively as I would like, but I hope it, your heart is stirred. That, that We don't have, here lies Jesus Christ in a tomb. You know what we have? He is not here. He is risen. Hallelujah. You know what it means? It means that he's victorious over the grave. It means he's victorious over sin. It means that your faith is not in vain. Praise the Lord for, for the cross of Christ. But he's not there. Amen? He's not in the grave. He's not on the cross. He's not in the Eucharist. He's in heaven. And he's coming back soon. Let me ask you a question. Are you ready for him to come back today? Would you be... Would, would, would you be happy for God to see you doing the things you're doing when He comes back? Or would you be ashamed? Well, I just want to encourage you in uh, the wonderful news that He is risen and there's an empty tomb. Let's close in a word of prayer.